Good morning. It is a lovely day on this 15th day in August. Let us give thanks for the gift of life, for the privilege of being able to gather together in this fashion. And as we prepare to gather together in person in September, let us remember these days and cherish the opportunity we will soon have to be together in person. Let us join in call to worship. As we gather in this sacred moment for a sacred purpose, let us make the most of our time together. We have come to worship, accept our praise. As we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, let us make the most of our time together. We have come for community, make us one. As your words tune our hearts, let us make the most of our time together. We have come to be nurtured by your spirit. Give us the wisdom to see it. Today, we acknowledge the land with these words. We meet on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat nations. Nations who agree to share the resources of the land with a dish with one spoon wampum covenant. We seek to live in respect, peace, and right relations with them as we live, work, and worship upon their traditional territory. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. In a world that can be challenging and overwhelming, Christ gives us hope. In a future that sometimes looks uncertain, the light of Christ shows us the way. We light this candle as a sign that we are ready to follow. Amen. Let us join our hearts as we sing our gathering hymn, Voices United 820, Make a Joyful Noise.
Let us pray. Creator, Christ and Spirit, when our souls hunger for fulfillment, you give us the bread of life. You touch our deepest hungers and fill us with good things. Creator, Christ and Spirit, when our souls thirst for communion with you, you offer us the fullness of life itself. You refresh us with living water. Creator, Christ and Spirit, when we long for what is authentic and for what endures, you show us the way, the truth and the life. And so we come to worship you, Creator, Christ and Spirit. Receive all our praise and gratitude, living God, for you are the source of all that matters now and evermore. God of all that matters, forgive our forgetfulness of, of what, what matters to you. Forgive the sins we know and those we have forgotten, the sins we have tried to hide and those we were once proud to commit. Forgive the sins we have done to please ourselves and the sins we have done to please others. Heal our lives and our relationships with your mercy and bless what we can become through your faithfulness to us. Amen. In Christ, all things are made new. Know that you are forgiven by his great mercy. Trust God's mercy and have the courage to forgive each other in Jesus name, amen. For seed of faith. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Seeds of Faith. I am Reverend Siddiqui. Can you see the accident waiting to happen? Can you think of one thing to do to make sure these accidents do not happen? Such as using the ladder the right way, not climbing on furniture, throwing fruit peels in the garbage instead of on the floor, not leaving the rake lying around, picking up toys when you're finished using them, these are some of the ways that those who are wise think. Let's put on our thinking caps. The seed for today is being wise. What does the Bible have to say about wisdom? Proverbs 8, 12 to 14 says, I, wisdom, live with prudence and I attain knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I have a good advice and sound wisdom. I have insight, I have strength. Hmm, what does that mean? According to Proverbs 8, 12 to 14, there are seven things that make up a wise decision. We could also say there are seven things that make a decision stand up or seven pillars of wisdom. And they are prudence, knowledge and discretion, fear of the Lord, good counsel, sound wisdom, understanding and power or strength. We need all seven if we are to be truly wise, if we are going to be able to make good decisions. If we remove any of them, then the decision we make is affected. It will not be as good as we would like, and the results of our decision will not be best for everyone. So let's look at what each of the seven pillars of wisdom mean. Prudence is the ability to judge beforehand what is likely to happen if we do this or that. 
like you are being prudent when you decide to put the rake away because leaving it out, someone could step on it and get hurt. Another important part of wisdom is having knowledge and discretion. You make plans knowing that things can change and you make a plan if things do not work out as planned. The fear of the Lord is not being scared of God. It is reverence. It means respecting God enough to not do bad things or not do evil things. Good counsel involves two things. It involves giving good advice to others and being willing to listen and learn from advice so that you also may be wise. Sound wisdom speaks about the way we use wisdom in our day-to-day -day life. In simple terms, it's about being fair. And being fair isn't that everybody gets the same thing. Being fair is that everybody gets what they need in order to be successful. Understanding refers to knowing the source of wisdom, getting information and learning from the correct sources, and then following the knowledge that is received in our actions. Power comes about when we use all the other six pillars and develop a solution to a problem to change the situation that we see. So here is the seed for this week make wise decisions when you make a decision be prudent show respect to god listen to advice and offer good advice be fair get information from the correct sources and use it change what you have the power to change don't just put on your thinking cap sometimes always wear it. See you next week. Bye. As we prepare to listen to the reading of scripture, more voices seven gather us in. Our first reading this morning is from Proverbs, 
chapter nine, verses one to six. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without scent, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. Our second reading is from one of Paul's letters. This one is to the Ephesians. It's chapter five, verses 15 to 20. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks to God the Father at all times for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we receive wisdom and understanding for these words. Amen. As we prepare to hear the spoken word, more voices, one, five, six. Dance with the Spirit. Let us pray. God of all wisdom and understanding, prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word, speaking through the scriptures. Quiet all that distracts us, that we may learn how to best follow you in the example of Christ, your living word. Amen. Growing up, my mother always spoke in parables. She often used them as warnings of impending trouble if her words were not heeded. One of her favorite idioms comes from the Latin verbum sapienti satise, which translates a word to the wise is sufficient. It means that wise people can take hints they don't need to have everything explained to them at great lengths. As I got older, I began to realize that wisdom is very different from knowledge or schooling. The dictionary defines knowledge as information gained through experience, reasoning, or acquaintance. Wisdom, on the other hand, is defined as the ability to discern or judge what is true, what is right, or what is lasting. Knowledge can exist without wisdom, but not the other way around. 
So one can be knowledgeable without being wise. An example that is given to show the difference between that what is knowledge and wisdom is knowledge is knowing how to use a gun. Wisdom is knowing when to use it and when to keep it holstered. When we consider some of the things we have said and done or what others have said and done, it, that seemed like a great choice at the time, but later proved to not be wise. You know those choices where we look at them now and say, what was I thinking? Now I would say, we were thinking, but we were not being wise. Wisdom is the next step after acquiring knowledge. It is the soundness of an action or a decision with regard to the application of experience, knowledge, and good judgment. When we study the scriptures, we are gaining knowledge. When we utilize the lessons from scripture to make decisions in our daily lives, that is our attempt at being wise. The Bible holds a variety of lessons geared towards helping us to become wise. wise. The book of Proverbs almost seems dedicated to this goal. Throughout the Proverbs, there is an attempt to define wisdom, to clarify its source, and to show the difference in outcomes between a wise person or a fool, or some translations refer to the person as a simple person. The prologue of Proverbs 1 states its intentions for learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity, to teach shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and prudence to the young. Let the wise also hear and gain in learning and the discerning acquire skill to understand a proverb and a figure the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. To be wise is an ongoing learning experience. We learn over time various elements needed to make a wise decision about situations. Pulling together knowledge from experience information and the desire for an outcome that is in the best interest of all. Proverbs 8, 12 to 14 lists the seven pillars of wisdom. They are prudence, knowledge with discretion, fear of the Lord, good counsel, sound wisdom, understanding, strength or power. Proverbs 9 explains how wisdom works. Wise decisions, first of all, take time. The proverb tells us that wisdom builds her house. She hews seven pillars into the foundation to hold it up and together. She slaughters her animals, she mixes her wine, she sets her table. Wisdom requires Assess, assessing the factors against the seven pillars. Pillars were built into a house when it was of substantial size and quality. And they were placed there to ensure the soundness of the building and to ensure that once the top is put on, it can withstand the weight. In other words, the pillars were used to ensure that when a decision is made, it can withstand scrutiny. It can withstand test. It can survive the test of time and at the same time is flexible enough to respond to the changes over time. I have friends who wear tattoos. I often discourage them from putting the names of boyfriends or girlfriends on their, on their skin. 
I say you can put your parents' names, maybe you can put your children's name, perhaps. A friend of mine in spur of the moment or in the spur of love, I suspect, put the letter C in a heart as a tattoo to celebrate his love for his girlfriend whose name started with a C. His wife's name does not start with a C. And he has yet to tattoo her letters on his body. So I asked him, so now that you, what are you going to do about the C? And he says, what was I thinking? I'm glad I didn't write out her whole name. Now I say it means I love Christ. So let's take the decision to eat half of a cheesecake by yourself and see if we can unpack these seven pillars in what to me is a wonderful idea. I love cheesecake. I probably could eat a whole cheesecake by myself. The first thing that we do when we think about having, making the decision about eating a whole cheesecake is what will the result of this action be? A change in the waistline, a change in the blood sugar level, maybe a few new pimples on her face. And if it is not the result that you want, then it's probably not prudent to have half a cheesecake by yourself. But does that mean we can't have cheesecake at all? Let's go to the second pillar. If we use our knowledge of cheesecake, the ingredients and apply discretion, we may find that we need a plan for eating cheesecake. The first matter on that plan is if you can have cheesecake, but it might not be able to be half. So how can we apply the principle of the pillar of the fear of the Lord to the decision to make, to have a half a cheesecake? One way that we show reverence to God is to be obedient to the guidance of scripture. The Bible is quite clear about excessive eating. Proverbs 25 verse 16 says, if you have honey, eat only enough for you, lest you have your fill of it and vomit. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. And in verse 19 of that same text, it says, or do you know, not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you have, you have from God? You are not your own. So godly guidance says, we may be well within our rights to have the freedom to eat half a cheesecake if we want, but it would not help or help. It would likely make us sick. It would damage our body in which the spirit of Christ dwells. So next we have the pillar of good counsel. Health experts would probably tell us that it's not a good idea. Imran would sarcastically say to me, go ahead, it's only more to take off later. My own self-talk by this time would say, it's probably not a good idea. Proverbs 25 verse 28 says, a person without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. By the time we get to Sound, to sound wisdom, the decision is half made, isn't it? Now is the question of fairness. Is it fair for you to have half of a cheesecake by yourself? What about the other people who might want cheesecake? Are we being fair to ourselves by feeding ourselves with half? And what would be a fair amount of cheesecake to satisfy the desire for a lot of cheesecake? From fairness comes the question of understanding. 
now we not only know what decision we have, what decision we should be making, we also understand the basis for our decision. And with that understanding, we are comfortable to act on it. And that is where power and strength comes in. Now we can make an informed decision regarding the eating of this cheesecake and happily grab a fork and have not half, but a big slice. These principles can be applied to the decision to start a war or not, to close a business or not, to return to in-person gathering or not, to marry a person you like or not, to decide to retire early or not, to take a trip, to choose between water or soda at the drive-thru. You might be thinking that it's a whole lot of thinking for just cheesecake, but the final decision reflects wisdom. Often, if we took the time to apply wisdom before we spoke and act, we would have better results. For the journey, the decisions we will make must be subject to the test of soundness according to the pillars of wisdom. The seven principles can be applied to the simple of decisions or to the most complex. Paul in Ephesians 5 verses 15 to 17a says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days of evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not drink or get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Debauchery is a discouragement against excessiveness. Instead, be filled with the spirit. Ephesians 5 verse 19b and 20 offer a second principle that the source of wisdom is the spirit. The spirit speaking to us through the Psalms, through the hymns, through the Psalms. And we are to use those sources to support and encourage each other, each other, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the spirit. With the spirit as a source of our wisdom, we are able to find peace and joy in the decisions we make. And we will be able to sing and make music from our heart to the Lord because of that confidence. The third important principle from the Proverbs for us today is that wisdom is available to all, but one must be open to receive it. We must be willing to accept wisdom's invitation and consume the elements that she has to offer. To accept wisdom's invitation takes maturity. And if we take her up on her invitation, it will result in a longer, fuller life of sound decisions and outcomes. Paul declares in 1 Corinthians 1, 24, that Jesus is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And we can look at Proverbs 9 as an invitation to join Jesus at the table and participate in the feast that he offers. It is an invitation to the kingdom where he has made preparations for us. It is an invitation brought by Jesus's servants sent to all who wish to come. The elements of bread and wine are familiar to us. And the joy of being in his presence and learning from him are immense. This text can be understood as an, act, an aspect of Jesus' invitation to follow his guidance 
and from the feast, we will be nourished to make the decisions for the journey ahead. I close with James chapter one and verse five, which tell us quite simply how to become wise. If any of you lack wisdom, ask God who gives generously to all without report, reproach and it will be given. Friends, for the journey ahead, we need to apply the pillars of wisdom. And let us not neglect to ask God to help us to make wise decisions. Amen. Now, our non-dinner dinner. Early, what are you doing? Well, I decided to finally get at some of the household chores you've been asking me to do. Everything has been done virtually for the last 18 months, so I, I'm going to virtually paint the living room. And after lunch, I'm going to virtually cut the lawn. Well, in that case, I will virtually make you a lovely dinner. Oh, no need, my dear. I bought us tickets for the Sharon Hope non-dinner dinner fundraising event. We have a small gathering coming to the house tonight, and other friends will join us virtually. You bought tickets to that zany event? But Tom, it isn't a real dinner. And if we have people coming over, we still need to make something. Well, very true, but I figure the money we would have spent on real fundraising dinner tickets and the food we would have donated to support the, the dinner and the time off work you would have taken to help are far less than what I spent on the non-dinner dinner tickets. Hmm. You know, I should probably buy more. The money goes to support the church's financial shortfall and we can log on to the Share and Hope YouTube channel to hear from Reverend Siddiqui and enjoy music from Donna Corbett. It would be a perfect evening. Now, before the paint starts drying, please let me get back to work. To get your tickets for the non-dinner dinner at Sharon Hope United Church, just Google the church's website. The non-dinner dinner fundraising details are right there. Thanks. Hey. Our hymn, Voices United 316, Praise or Maker, as we give thanks for the gifts. The Psalms urge us to always give thanks to God for everything God has provided. 
In gratitude, we offer to God a portion of what God has given us, trusting that God will bless what we will bring and multiply our gifts to serve God's good purposes. Let us pray. Lord God, loving God, we bring you our gifts with thanksgiving, grateful for all that we share in Christ and in creation. Bless us and our offerings so that we may live to bring you glory and share with the world the love you pour out on us day by day. Amen. For our prayers of the people in the garden performed by Pierce. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling But he bids me go Through the voice of woe His voice to me is calling And he walks with me And he talks with me And he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known let us pray gracious god we are grateful for your presence with us in all things especially in times of challenge and change. We thank you for times of rest and reunion this summer, for opportunities to see those we have been missing during times of lockdown. Yet we know this summer still holds deep challenges for many. And so we bring before you those people and places on our minds and hearts. We pray for the families and communities facing fire and flood, watching and worrying about what will remain of their homes and their hometowns. Protect those who fight fires and conduct rescues and open our hearts in generosity to do what we can to assist recovery. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers.
We pray for the earth, for the land and the seas, suffering in the heat, and for the creatures being displaced by disaster and disruption. Protect all that is precious to you in creation and open our hearts to live more responsibly within the balance of life you created. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for people facing hatred and discrimination and for those coming to terms with historic injustice and injury. Guide the relations between Indigenous people and other Canadians to correct misunderstanding and create justice for all communities. Open our hearts to discover what we share as your children and appreciate the different gifts we have to offer to each other. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those who are suffering this summer, those who face pain or illness, those who are dying and who know bereavement, all who are anxious about what lies ahead and any who do not have enough to make ends meet. Bring courage and comfort to those who are struggling and open our hearts to offer the friendship and companionship which can ease their journey. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. In silence, we hold before you those near and dear to us. Speak to us the truth we need to hear and guide us in our relationships. We lift up, especially today, John Southwood, Roger Fox, Cherry McQuarrie, Linda and Tracy, for those dealing with wildfires. We lift up the Afghan nation, its people and the diaspora. We lift up to you and pray for the passing of this fourth wave. We remember the families who have lost loved ones this week due to the COVID complications. We pray for increased access to the COVID shot for countries in need. We pray for wisdom as we make choices in the coming months. And we lift up Haiti after this recent earthquake. Receive our prayers spoken and unspoken. Oh God, as we offer the words Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Our closing hymn, Sing and Make Music in Your Hearts to the Lord.
receive the blessing. Grant us, O oh Lord, understanding minds that we might know how to live. Grant us discerning hearts that we might know the difference between good and evil and how we might live to please you. Empower us to be prudent, understanding, and use our discretion as we make decisions in the days to come. Grant us, O oh Lord, peace and bring peace and hope in all the places we go and share with others in your name, amen. Our choral parting, Voices United 424, may the God of hope. Have a good week, everyone, and see you in September. <laughs>